Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot Welcome to Left of Black. We are joined today by Miss Camille A. Brown, a prolific choreographer, a dancer. She is a Bessie Award winner for her most recent piece, Mr. Tolerance. She's a 2015 Doris Duke Artist Award recipient, a 2015 TED Fellow, and a two-time Princess Grace recipient. And we're talking here today on the eve of her next show, Black Girl Linguistic Play, which opens at the Joyce Theater on September 22nd, runs to the 27th. How are you doing today, Camille? I'm good, I'm good Mark. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be on your show again. It's an honor to have you on the show. We're really excited about this new work that you're doing, uh, you know, about looking at the significance of what we think of as play or black girls play and, and how it has a significant impact on black girls' identity. So talk a little bit of how you got to this project, particularly after the last project, Mr. Tolerance, you know, looked so significantly at a history of stereotypes. How did you end up with black girl linguistic play? Yeah. Well, it was, uh, it's funny because when I was creating Tolerance, uh, Tolerance uh, has a talkback component, a dialogue, which we were honored to have you moderate uh, at our performances at ADF. And one of the things that would happen uh, would be black women would come up to me and ask me if I was going to focus more specifically on the issues um, facing black women and black girls. And... I felt immediately that, okay, if I'm going to talk about it, I don't want to feel like there is a sense of obligation. Um, I understood because they were coming to me that people were looking at me as having a certain voice and a certain platform, and I wanted to honor that, but I also wanted to honor what I can give as a personal contribution to that story. So I started thinking about it, started thinking about the stereotypes that were specifically towards black girls and black females. And I started getting exhausted and I realized that I was living those stereotypes. I was living between those tropes every day, the angry black female, the strong black female. And I asked myself if I wanted to, aside from living that life and fighting against that, did I want to spend another year and a half within the creative space talking about those things, which we hit on a little intolerance, but it wasn't as specific. So I looked at the political climate and I thought to myself, okay, well, what can you contribute to it? And instead of finding the things that I saw, I started focusing on the things that I didn't see, hmm. which were childhood memories. I have not seen a lot of stories told about black girls being hmm. that, girls hmm. playing, having fun. Uh, and I wanted to talk about those things. And I actually realized in myself that it, it, it was hard for me to get back to that place because I have been living my adulthood for so long. And in that sense, what does that mean? You know, it's an interesting irony because on the one hand, we can go back to the images that we saw at the beginning of the summer in 2015, uh, the pool party in Texas, the young black girl who straddled by a police officer, and, and everyone reacted to the fact that, you know, he treated her as if she wasn't a child, right. which is exactly what she was. Yet at the same time, we look at the two Obama daughters, and there's a way in which we've seen these two black girls grow up in public in ways that we've never seen black girls grow up in public, but yeah. yet somehow their image is don't translate to the ways that the larger society think about black girls who aren't named Obama. Right. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, too. It's, it's, it's almost like they're putting it like, oh, these are just these two girls. That's yeah. their story. Um, but there are a lot of other girls, a lot of other black girls that have that same story. And I think that's the beauty of us looking at them and going, yes, that is my story. Yes, that I know that story. And how can I put those stories? How can I put that within the culture on stage and claim it as art? Something that might, like Double Dutch, like Jump Rope, Hand Clap Games, maybe people consider trivial, maybe people consider things that we should put aside to grow up, but what about that gives us a sense of loss because that's that's our joy, that's part of our identity and our joy and what happens when we're told to leave that and what happens when we're told that we shouldn't acknowledge these as musical contributions or actually art. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined today by Camille Brown of the Camille Brown Dancers. Uh, her latest piece of work, 
Black Girl Linguistic Play opens at the Joyce Theater on September the 22nd, runs through the 27th. One of the things that you just narrated that I found really interesting uh, was that you were very responsive to black women who were watching your performance and responded in part, you know, in your next level of creation. Uh, we've talked in the past about the difficulty of what it means to be a black artist, where so many of the funding streams obviously are coming from white foundations and white funders. Very often the audiences uh, are typically more white than, than black. How important was it for you to be able to perform, for instance, Mr. Tolerance in front of black audiences and then have black audience members respond in the way that they do? And, and what kind of expectations are you expecting for this new play in terms of that kind of response? Yeah, uh, we usually perform uh, across the country and internationally, we usually perform to majority white audiences. Uh, so a lot of times it's really about translating what's happening on stage yeah, yeah. and when we have the opportunity to have a more integrated audience or a predominantly black audience uh for me it's it's encouraging i mean it's encouraging with those other audiences as well but there's another layer that adds on when there are people in the audience that know exactly what you're talking about um and with this piece i'll use my mom for an example hmm. Uh, when she comes to my shows, she always says she loves them and she enjoys them. But for this particular piece, I want her to see herself. Yeah. And I want black girls to see themselves. Uh, and I want them to be proud of our dimensions within a hand clap or a hand on our hip. You know, we're told yeah. in society yeah. that when we do these gestures, they are ghetto or, you know, they're, they're more on the, they, they give negative connotations. But I know a snap can mean five different things, <laughs> depending on how you use it. You know, so what happens when you take these things and you take this knowledge and you put it on stage and you're not apologizing, you're not teaching either, you're just being. You know, we were both fortunate last year, in fact, to present uh, at a tribute uh, conference, I guess you could call that, for Carrie Mae Weems. Um, so I, I got to see a, a very early moment of the development of this particular performance. Uh, recently, you were on MSNBC with Janet Mock, and you had another opportunity to perform, you know, an aspect of the play. And, and of course, that particular aspect focused around Double Dutch. And, and these girls and black girls play, these games that black girls play, you know, recalling the work of Kira Gaunt, uh, we can think about the brand new work of Amy Cox, um, Shapeshifters. Talk about these quote unquote, what we now think of as ghetto games and, and how important those quote unquote ghetto games were to the development of black girls having a sense of themselves, having a sense of agency. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so funny to do <laughs> to dance double ju dutch 20 years after I actually <laughs> did it. <laughs> it's a different kind of preparation that I'm doing. Um, but it's also fun to relive that and what that meant as a black girl within. It was almost, I'm, I'm originally from Jamaica, Queens. Mm -hmm. And everyone either was making up dances on the side of the street or they were playing double dutch. And if you didn't know how to jump into the rope, <laughs> at least jump into the rope, there was a serious problem. Right. <laughs> so it's what are these unspoken rituals that black girls have? You know, no one told me I needed to do it. Just that's just what it was. That's how that's how we were able to claim who we were and identify. And something is very um, empowering about that and the sisterhood and what does it mean and the camaraderie. And the, and the shifts and the riffing off of each other. You know, it's it's like a musical, it's a musical score. That's what I call um, the section that I do with Kat. I told her that I wanted it to be a musical score of black girls and what that is and the beats and the hip hop and the, and the jazz and the groove, all of those things that you find that people um, might think are ghetto, but they are extremely mm -hmm. compositionally mm -hmm. brilliant mm -hmm. and complicated. And um, one of the, I, I was watching the doc documentary, Let's Get the Rhythm, mm -hmm. and where they had the jazz uh, musicians just saying how complicated numbers the hand, the hand game is and, and double dutch and, and, you know, these aren't trivial things. And if you really listen to the beats and listen to the rhythms, those are things that people are doing in, in clubs on the drums, you yeah. know, but their feet are the drums. You know, in, in many ways, it offers insight to the genius of black girls. Um, and it's, it's something that's dismissed 
as not important because it's thought of as play. But we're also at a moment where these are kind of everyday practices that are being lost. Um, when we look at, for instance, the success on the international stage of someone like Serena Williams, we think about Aaliyah Neal, you know, for instance, in the swimming pool, you know, we're at a historical moment where black girls, you know, can think about, you know, excelling athletically in sports that they never would have had access to 50 years ago. And then, of course, in the everyday lives of, of everyday black girls, you know, the competition with television, with the computer, with handheld games, you know, we don't see as many kids outside, if you will. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, especially in the summertime, my mother's like, go outside, leave me alone, go outside and play. I mean, there's not as much opportunities for lots of reasons, you know, for black children, for black girls in particular, to be able to do those kinds of activities now is something being lost in terms of you know, black girls' intellectual production, in terms of black girls' genius, in terms of black girls having a real sense of, them, of their bodies and the self-esteem about their bodies, is something being lost because we can't play those games as easily as we did, say, 20 years ago? I think there's something that's definitely lost. I think when I can speak about uh, creating the work, it's, it's almost like I have found myself again. Mm. Uh, and because I forgot what that looked like. I had been so far removed from it. And, and like you said, I haven't, I haven't really seen that aspect of walking outside and seeing girls playing on the side of the street. I actually see a lot of uh, young black men playing uh, basketball and I see, I see them out a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but girls, I don't see that as much. And I think when we think of our bodies, we also think for me as a dancer, I think of it as a form of empowerment too. And what is lost when you only see in the media that your body is being sex sexualized, but you're not being taught about how your body can also be a form of empowering right. empowerment and then how you can use it in a way to express yourself that does not have to be sexual. Uh, you and your team have been very aggressive about trying to make sure that the, we had as many folks come out to support the show, um, you know, trying to get nights hosted by various groups, that are particularly interested in there being some sort of bridge space for black men to be able to connect to what's happening on stage. And then, of course, the Saturday night, uh, having Dream Hampton there and, and having all these folks being able to come together. How important has it been for you to do this community outreach? Oh, extremely. I, I am honored to have been on the Joy stage for many, uh, many performances. Uh, my, my company, uh, Ron Brown's company, mm. uh, and other, as a guest in other companies. But this, uh, I think, is so important for the community around the Joy Theater to see black women coming together, to see black men supporting black women, um, for us to all be in the conversation about race or culture or how these themes are universal as well yeah. because i think sometimes when people come in the title alone automatically they they disengage oh that has nothing to do with me but for me when i was creating this work i wanted there to be a sense of duality and i think uh, our last conversation one of the last conversations is it, it it's almost like you don't know what we're talking about because this is more of like an inner Right. circle right. but you know what we're talking about because we're talking about the human experience we're talking about the power of sisterhood and the many um different stages that that can take and that's a human story a mom a daughter a sister um that that goes past race so i wanted to talk about two things and what happens when all groups are represented in, oh excuse me all groups are represented in the space which i don't get to have sometimes so it's important for the community to be there um and in, and it's important for me to be in a position to give i i hope it is seen as a gift to, to give this as a gift back because i'm i'm mm. almost creating it as a gift to myself to give it and to remind myself who i am but also for black women and black girls to see themselves too you know, talk a little bit about your relationship, both in terms of your work and even as an individual, to this larger legacy of black women in dance. 
um, you know, when we think about younger generations of folks in, in terms of popular culture, I mean, they, they don't know who Catherine Dunham is. Um, yeah. They don't know who Pearl Primus is. And, you know, Pearl yeah. Primus is such a fascinating figure, dancer, choreographer, PhD, you know, <laughs> and, and anthropology from, from NYU. You know, who are the, some of the folks that you feel as though your art is in conversation with that you're linked to in terms of their legacy? Uh, well, it's in, <laughs> um, I think we're all connected. Um, I recently, Blondell Cummings passed away. Yeah. And um, I immediately thought of how amazing her contributions have been to the dance world. But then I also was upset because I knew that her story is not being told yeah, right. the way it should be within... Right dance and education and I am still thinking about that um, because it's sad like you said Catherine Dunham um, it's it's just it's not right um, but what can I do to make sure that Blondell's name keeps moving in the dance world um, not only specifically her work, but how can I apply the tools that she used or the tools that she created inside of my own work? So then I hopefully and humbly will be able to carry on that that legacy that she had. Um, and yeah, so yeah, I mean, Pearl is, uh, and also Diane McIntyre too. Uh, I was really, really inspired by her work when I worked directly with her as a dancer. And I and once I was immersed in her process, I said, oh, my gosh, that's exactly the process that I want. <laughs> um, so it's 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 about really honoring those people that have paved the way for you um, and making sure I always say I don't want to let them down. Um, yeah. Well, you know, you've been doing wonderful work now, um, very much um, uplifting a tradition. Um, and of course, with this new performance, Black Girl Linguistic Play, you just take it to a whole nother level. Uh, we are excited about the performance. We are excited for you. Uh, Joyce Theater, September 22nd through the 27th in New York. Thank you for joining us today, Camille. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it